This is the philosophy of Praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feinberg. Uh, chapter two, the demands of reason. Deontological grounds for revolution. The ambition of philosophy of Praxis is to link the fulfillment of what Marx calls the demands of reason to revolutionary political goals. The establishment of this link implies that revolution can be rationally justified and that the practice of a rational life includes revolutionary political action. These are in fact fundamental conclusions of the early Marx and Lucas. In his early works, Marx develops a meta-critique of political philosophy and derives a rationale for revolution from it. In history and class consciousness, Lucas constructs a meta-critique of classical German philosophy from which he too derives a rationale for revolution. And not coincidentally, Marcuse's major book on Hegel is, in, is, in, is entitled Reason and Revolution. This chapter is primarily concerned with Marx's early justification of revolution, while chapter 5 will take up Lucas's related argument and chapter eight will consider Marcuse's different approach to the same conclusion. By way of introduction, it will be helpful to consider the traditional idea of the right of revolution. Throughout most of its history, political philosophy has been more concerned with rational grounds for obedience to government than with the right of revolution. In modern times, obedience has been justified by reference to functions performed by the state that benefit the individuals. However, the expectation of a fair return for obedience may be disappointed. Then, when the state fails to fulfill its functions, grounds for obedience become grounds for revolution. Similarly, most, just, most justifications of revolution imply a theory of obligation to a legitimate state. This dialectic of obedience and revolt is not a sign of inconsistency in political philosophy but on the contrary, results from its, its consistent commitment to rationality in a world of contingencies. These observations are confirmed by the early theories of Marx and Lucas. In both cases, in both cases conservative political doctrines subjected to a meta-critique are transformed into the revolutionary opposites precisely in the name of reason. We can gauge their originality originality by comparison with earlier political theory. The classic ground for revolution, formulated for example by Locke, is teleological or utilitarian in character. Locke believes that the end of government is the good of mankind. Although Marxists only rarely offer utilitarian arguments for revolution, a vaguely utilitarian concern for human happiness constitutes the moral aura of most Marxist discourse. Marxists add to Locke's critique of political relations a parallel critique of property relations, both of which, in their view, should be instrumental to the good of mankind. Locke's main point is conserved. Society as a common creation of human beings should serve their interests and not the contrary. Socialism undoubtedly originated in some such sense of revolution as a legitimate collective means to happiness. But this is not a sufficient phil philosophical justification of revolution. Kant shows that a rational being has higher interests than those discovered through a utilitarian calculus, including duties of obedience to the state, regardless of material consequences. By conceptualizing this higher sphere of duty in terms of a dialectical theory of individuation and mutual recognition, Hegel succeeds in basing similar conclusions on a far more sophisticated social theory. Thus, in Kant and Hegel, philosophy takes a conservative turn. Denying the pertinence of the utilitarian grounds for revolu revolution put forth in theories such as Locke's. Marx revives revolutionary theory not by a regression to utilitarianism but rather by developing a new deontological ground for revolution based on the intrinsic nature of rationality. Deontological grounds for revolution flow from the demand for a rational polity, 
independent of the use to be made of the freedom it grants, whether it be happiness, self-actualization, human dignity, etc. Rousseau was the chief earlier representative of this position. For him, freedom as the actual exercise of self-determining rationality is an end in itself. The difference between teleological and deontological grounds for revolution is especially clear in Locke's and Rousseau's discussions of slavery. Both are against it, but for very different reasons. Locke argues that slavery is Ill illegitimate because this freedom from absolute arbitrary power is so necessary to and closely joined with a man's preservation that he cannot part with it, but by which forfeits his preservation in life together. Rousseau, on the contrary, makes no appeal to the right to life, but claims that moral self-responsibility is incompatible with slavery. He argues that when a man renounces his liberty, he renounces his essential manhood, his rights, and even his duty as a human being. It is incompatible with man's nature, and to deprive him of his free will is to deprive his actions of all moral sanction. Deontological grounds for revolution are usually explained, as Rousseau does here, by reference to an absolute value placed on human freedom, the right of each individual to, to determine himself and to secure respectful treatment from others. Where political conditions prevent this, they ought to be overthrown. Here we pass from the mere right of revolution, which flows from a concern with human happiness, to an obligation to revolution in the name of freedom. This is very much the sort of problem that preoccupies the young Marx. He writes in one early essay, to be radical is to grasp things by the root, but for man the root is man himself. The criticism of religion ends with the doctrine that man is the supreme being for man. It ends, therefore, with a categorical imperative to overthrow all those conditions in which man is an abased, enslaved, abandoned, contemptible being. For the young Marx, a revolution à la hauteur des principes is a revolution for freedom and dignity. Basic to this theory of revolution is the idea that the rational subject is not fulfilled merely in thought, nor even in private morality but also requires a sphere of public activity. But where rationality must be deployed, there freedom too is necessary. For freedom is the formal electment of rationality, the only form in which reason can be. Thus for Marx as for Rousseau, revolution is a condition for the full exercise of reason. It is comparable with Cartesian doubt or the enlightenment struggle against superstition as an attack on contingent obstacles to rationality and as a methodological preliminary to the flowering of humankind's highest faculty. Marx's concern with the problem of revolutionary rationality is formulated explicitly in some of his earliest writings. He tries to show that revolution can satisfy the demands of reason, that through it reason or philosophy can be realized in social reality. This terminology is, of course, Hegelian. It was Hegel who first proposed to show that reason was realized, that the contradiction between the rational concept of the state and its historical reality and fin had finally been overcome. This philosophical tour de force was intended to lay the revolution to rest, to deprive it of the halo of rationality with which the Enlightenment had surrounded it. Starting from such premises, Marx's task is laid out for him to demonstrate that reason is not in fact realized, that it continues to produce demands transcendent to the given state of affairs, that revolution is therefore still a rational act. But after Kant and Hegel, it is impossible to renew revolutionary theory by returning to the speculative methods of a Rousseau. Kant's argument against revolution is based precisely on the implicit grounds for obedience to government contained in Rousseau's revolutionary theory. This theory itself must therefore be submitted to a radical critique in order to discover how political philosophy had been reconciled prematurely 
with an unjust society and to find in it elements that can be reformulated to again ground a revolutionary struggle against this society. The core of this effort consists in overcoming the antinomy of reason and need Marx identifies as constitutive of the entire tradition of political philosophy. Marx subjects these concepts to a radical revision in the course of which he develops his metacritical approach. Marx's metacritique of political philosophy is based on a specific construction of the relation between reason and need that derives largely from a Kantian interpretation of Rousseau. This limits the bearing of Marx's analysis, which simply assumes that the essence of the whole tradition is revealed in what is presumably its highest stage. Nevertheless, the analysis is at least an interesting hypothesis about political philosophy in general. Furthermore, Marx's approach is sociologically justified because it is the doctrine of Rousseau-Kant that underlies the democratic ideology of the French Revolution as understood by later German liberalism. Marx assumes with Rousseau and Kant that freedom is not whim, but obedience to self-given law. With them, he also assumes that the rules of conduct cannot be derived from happiness as an end, but flow from the concept of autonomy. The rational individual owes it to himself to maintain his independence from both his own needs and the power of other men. Happiness is not, however, a matter of indifference for Rousseau, nor even for Kant. In Rousseau, for example, freedom is essentially the right and the power to do what is in one's own, own interests as a member of the community. Freedom is a value in itself, but it is also bound up with the pursuit of collective self-interest in the higher sphere of politics. It has been argued that in Kant too, right conduct establishes general forms of social interaction that maximize the freedom of each individual to follow his merely natural end, which is happiness. Kant does not so much reject the pursuit of happiness as reduce it to an anthropological or empirical consideration, thereby clearly delineating the boundaries between deontological and utilitarian grounds for political action. The basis of this philo philosophical distinction is the praxeological one between ethics and economics. In the ethical form of action, the behavior of all subjects is, in is intrinsically compatible. Well, economic behavior is conflictual and competitive. Ethical action achieves harmony through conformity to a universal rule. It can thus be called rational. The pursuit of material welfare is mere content of experience, determined by nature and therefore contingent. It is compatible in principle with ethical behavior, but subordinate to it by right. Marx argues that this construction of the relation of reason and need splits the ideal of freedom from the actual motives freedom serves. This split undercuts the protest against poverty in a formerly rational society, reducing such protest to a marginal concern of merely empirical interest. Life becomes a means to rationality in a topsy-turvy vision likely to satisfy only those for whom the means of life are assured. What is required is a reformulation of political theory to establish the intrinsic rationality and universality of the pursuit of happiness and the satisfaction of the needs on which happiness depends. Marx worked out this program in three stages to which correspond three important early works. In the first part of the essay on the Jewish question, he attacks the problem of need in order to show that the conflictual form of action associated with it is not natural and necessary but historical and therefore subject to revolutionary change. This essay culminates in a new formulation of the concept of freedom, compatible with the revision of the concept of need. The second stage of the analysis is developed in the contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right introduction. There, Marx deduces the political and social conditions for realization of his new concept of freedom. This text identifies the proletariat as the agent of a revolution that will abolish philosophy in realizing it. The last stage is reached in the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. There, Marx follows the thread back to its beginning and the concept of reason, which he now sets out to revise.
The Antinomy of Reason and Need. Marx's essay on the Jewish question is an attempt to explain the contradiction between the ideal democratic state and the facts of capitalist social life. This contradiction results from the split between moral political rationality, the basis of the state, and utilitarian anthropological goals, the basis of the economy. As it appears in Rousseau and the French Revolution, filtered through Kant and Hegel, Marx argues that the split is reflected in the distinction between man and citizen in French revolutionary theory, which corresponds with the distinction between civil society, the sphere of private activity, and the state, the sphere of cooperative activity. The state accumulates the determinations of rationality, reflexivity, necessity, and universality. It is the locus of species life, a term derived from Feuerbach that signifies the consciously social and cooperative nature of man. The merely empirical functions of natural human existence are then consigned to the sphere of civil society where the individual lives his real life, as opposed to his ideal life as a rational citizen in the state. In civil society, the individuals create a competitive hell. Human action does not achieve rational universality there, but is rather mere nature. Marx writes, the perfect political state is by its nature, the species life of man as opposed to his material life. All the presuppositions of this, of this egoistic life continue to exist in civil society outside the politi political sphere as qualities of, as qualities of civil society where the political state has attained to its full development. Man leads not only in thought, in consciousness, but in reality in life, a double existence celestial and terrestrial terrestrial he lives in the political community where he acts simply as a private individual treats other men as means degrades himself to the role of a mere means and becomes the plaything of alien powers in presenting the problem in this manner marx is not simply criticizing the egoism of bourgeois society there is that, but more important is the fact that species life is decisively linked to reason in the concept of the state. Rationality in the political domain is, is exemplified by the cooperative aspect of human nature, which takes refuge in the state once it has been driven from civil society. As Marx put it in a letter, of, in a letter to Rouge, reason has always existed, but not always in a rational form. As far as actual life is concerned, the political state especially contains in all its modern forms the demands of reason, even where the political state is not yet conscious of socialistic demands. The task now is to criticize the irrational and contradictory form in which reason exists in the modern state and to explain why it has been confined to this limited domain while actual life persists as a natural residue in civil society. Marx seeks a solution through a critique of the limits of the concept of political revolution, which is still equivalent for him with the French Revolution. Political revolution aims to maximize individual freedom in private life while accepting its basis as received from the ancien regime, namely private property, which it purifies of feudal restrictions. This revolution, Marx says, regards civil society, the sphere of human needs, labor, private interests, and civil law as the basis of its own existence, as a self-subsistent precondition, and thus as its natural basis. Civil society appears essentially as a sphere of nature because it lacks the most important determinations of rationality. On the one hand, the political revolution does not conceive of civil society as a historical result, as the outcome of a process of mediation, hence as a self-reflected and self-developed sphere of reason. Instead, it is seen as the product of the unmediated natural inclinations of the egoistic individuals. These egoistic individuals are simply received by the revolution as the passive, given result of the dissolution of society, of the ancien regime an object of direct apprehension and consequently a natural object. On the other hand, as a natural man, 
the merely given product of instinct and need, the egoistic individual of bourgeois society is plunged into a bellum omnium contra omnis. The activity of this egoistic individual consists in competitive struggle. Its form is merely particular and falls under no universal law. Marx claims that the contradiction between reason and need, the one mediated, necessary, and universal, the other empirically given, contingent, and particular, cannot be resolved on the ground of capitalist society. Marx goes on to show that the bourgeois split in the individual between need and reason, man and citizen, is a dialectical one in which each antinom antinomial opposite requires the other for its existence. The polarity of man and citizen reflects a split in human nature, inevitable in capitalist society, between its empirical content and its rational essence. Marx writes, Man as he really is, is seen only in the form of egoistic man, and man in his true nature only in the form of abstract citizen. The empirical man of civil society is the really existing human being, an egoistic individual standing in perpetual contradiction with its own rational duty as citizen. But only through the citizen can the man exist, that is, can the individual freely pursue private interests under the protection of the state. Meanwhile, the ideal citizen, as a rational actor, manifests the essence of what it is to be human. Yet the citizen is there only to protect and defend the rights of egoistic man. Existence and essence require each other and also stand in contradiction. Political revolution founders on this antinomy. It confines itself to liberating a pre-given nature characterized by irrational private competition. In contrast to this nature, reason has a bare artificial existence as an allegorical moral person in the citizen. Most abstractly formulated, the dilemma is an example of the fundamental antinomy of form and content central to Lucas's version of the philosophy of praxis. Rational form here presides over empirical content, not by mediating it and raising it to a rational universality, but by leaving it be in its given irrational condition. At this very abstract level, Marx's critique of formal democracy is structurally similar to Lucas's critique of Kantian ethics. In Lucas's terms, the antinomy of reason and need is an example of the more general antinomy of value and fact, of ought and is, that arises from the formalistic concept of reason. This concept of reason is based on the acceptance of immediacy, that is to say on the failure to discover in the given facts those potentialities and tendencies embodying rationality and driving toward a rational end. Instead, the given is defined as indifferent to reason and value, as the merely empirical, factical residue of the process of formal abstraction in which the concept of reason is constructed. As Lucas puts it, precisely in the pure classical expression it received in the philosophy of Kant, it remains true that the ought presupposes an existing reality to which the category of ought remains inapplicable in principle. This is the dilemma of bourgeois democracy as Marx explains it. Political rationality presupposes an irrational social existence as its material substratum. Marx and Lucas arrive at similar solutions to the problem they have identified. For Marx, it is necessary to transform civil society into a sphere of rational interaction. But paradoxically, this is not a political goal. Marx was aware of the Hegelian critique of Jacobin voluntarism and quite self-consciously worked toward a non-voluntaristic -vol formulation of revolutionary theory. Marx believed political revolution to be through and through tied to class society because in it moral principles contrary to the material interests of the individuals must be imposed by the state on a separate civil society of private owners. A revolution to abolish class society and private property would only reproduce these evils were it to attempt to impose morality in opposition to their interests. Rather, a social revolution against the very principle of class would necessarily have to be rooted in these interests. 
Only on this condition would it overcome the antinomy of state and civil society, reason and need. Marx writes, the political revolution dissolves civil society into its elements, egoistic individuals, without revolutionizing these elements themselves or subjecting them to criticism. What is required is precisely the revolutionizing of private and individual existence so that it too conforms with the demands of reason. The content of free activity must no longer stand in contradiction with freedom itself. In the more abstract terms of Lucas, this solution consists in annulling that indifference of form toward content, which is the basis of reified rationality. At this point, Marx derives what might be called a new concept or begriff of free society from the offbung of the contradiction between the concept and the object of traditional democratic political theory. He does not yet know concretely what rational social activity would consist in, but he knows the condition for such activity, namely the transcendence of the opposition between private egoism and rational cooperation. Collective action in the common interest, action based on the reciprocal recognition of the humanity and needs of all, must, must transcend the narrow boundaries of politics and extend to economic life as well. Economic activity must have a rational form and human needs partake of rational universality through the reciprocal recognition. Marx concludes, human emancipation will only be complete when the real individual man has absorbed into himself the abstract citizen. When as an individual man in his everyday life, in his work and in his relationships, he has become a species being and when he has recognized and organized his own powers, forces, or force, or force propre as social powers, so that he no longer separates this social power from himself as political power. This condition for the fulfillment of the demands of reason is contained already in abstract form in the modern state. It is the new basis of deontological grounds for a revolution that will realize philosophy. In sum, Marx has shown that political philosophy accepts the irrational form of the pursuit of happiness. Civil society as a natural fact, and so applies the demands of reason only to the state. These demands concern the establishment of a true community through the reconciliation of antinomic opposites, such as individual and society, private interest and common good, and all the similar displacements of the antinomy of content and form in the political domain. Marx demonstrates that community cannot be realized in the state, which rules civil society based on a conflictual form of action. To fulfill the demands of reason, it will be necessary to also realize them in civil society. To accomplish this, in turn, it is necessary to overcome what Lucas calls the immediacy of the sphere of need, its philosophically naturalized form. Marx conceptualizes this transformation as a social revolution that not only changes the state, but also revolutionizes the elements themselves. Community can be realized at all levels of society, including the material level of the sphere of need, only when the pursuit of happiness has been transformed. The Agent of Revolution Marx's next step consists in finding a possible agent for the radical transformation of man and citizen. This proves to be a more delicate matter than first appears. On the one hand, Marx must base, base his new concept of freedom on some actual social force to escape the merely abstract ethical relation of philosophy to reality that he has already satirized in his letter to Rouge. On the other hand, in attempting to base his philosophy on a real social force, there is the danger that he will reduce historical action to a mere instrument of philosophy, which latter would then be the real subject of the revolutionary process. From the subject-object relation, the state would be reborn. Marx first approaches this problem in a speculative form in the contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right introduction. There he arrives at an at an undialectical construction of the relation of theory to practice, philosophy to the proletariat, 
that does not so much overcome the abstract character of ethical demands as attribute the, this very abstractness to the demands of an entire social class. Lucien Goldman suggests that this failure is not of, of merely biographical interest, but that the undialectical conclusions of this text anticipate the later undialectical theory practice relation in the socialist movement. In fact, it suffices to replace the word philosophy in the introduction with the word party. And at bottom, in the two cases, we are concerned with an ideolo ideology elaborating group in order to obtain a position very close to what expressed to that expressed by Lenin in his work, What is to be Done. Marx's failure in this essay is due in part to his method, which differs radically from that of his later sociological and economic work. He does not start from an analysis of society, but from philosophy. He takes his new philosophical concept of freedom and tests it against the various classes of society to find one that can serve as its representative in practice. As he puts it, revolutions need a passive element, a material basis. Or again, theory itself becomes a material force when it has seized the masses. Marx's essay looks like a class analysis, and indeed some features of it anticipate his later theory of class. He argues that previous um, merely political revolutions have failed to achieve human emancipation because they have liberated not many but particular classes from oppression. Or sorry, not man, but particular classes from oppression. The French bourgeoisie, for example, was oppressed by the nobility in terms of its particular interests. The wrongs it suffered appeared to all other classes to exemplify the general injustice of the society, and so they supported its revolution. But the liberation of the bourgeoisie from these wrongs was not human emancipation, but only bourgeois emancipation. It did not free humanity, but only the bourgeoisie to pursue its interests, which in turn came into conflict with the interests of society as a whole. Thus it is the very principle of class that limits political revolution. Marx concludes, and this distinguishes his early method from that of the later works, that his philosophy cannot be realized by social class in the usual sense, but only by a class in civil society which is not a class of civil society, a class which is the dissolution of all classes. What he is seeking, in other words, is a class that is not a class, a universal class in something like Hegel's sense of the term, with no particular interest at all hence none opposed to that of society as a whole. Having arrived at a rather Hegelian formulation of the problem in his earlier essay, it is not surprising that he here reaches a variant of the Hegelian solution. Marx argues that the proletariat alone of all classes can go beyond a merely political revolution to a general social revolution, for it has no place within the existing system. It is, Marx claims, and here he was right for his time, if not for ours, the product of the disintegration of other social strata with no sectional interests of its own to defend. For this reason, its project can be truly universal in character and can bring down the system of class that Marx now identifies as the source of egoistic individualism and the basis of civil society. Marx concludes that only the proletariat can revolutionize the elements themselves that is, transform what it, I what it is to be an individual in society, for it has no interest in conserving a particular status opposed to the whole, hence no interest in perpetuating the split between civil society and the state. The proletariat thus appears as the appropriate instrument of Marxist philosophy, and the demand for revolution is now addressed to the class, or to this class. Marx writes, Philosophy is the head of this emancipation and the proletariat is its heart. Philosophy can only be realized by the abolition of the proletariat and the proletariat can only be abolished by the realization of philosophy. In spite of the elegant symmetry of this solution, it falls far short of resolving the problems Marx has posed for himself. Here, theory and practice arise independently and if proletarian revolution satisfies essential demands of theory, it is by no means clear that the proletariat intends this result in revolting. Lucas remarks, 
The issue turns on the question of theory and practice, and this not merely in the sense given it by Marx when he says in his first critique of Hegel that theory becomes a material force when it has seized the masses. Even more to the point is the need to discover those features and determinations both of the theory and the ways of seizing the masses, which convert the theory, the dialectical method into a vehicle of revolution. We must extract the practical essence of the theory from the method and its relation to its object. If this is not done, then seizing the masses could well turn out to be a will of the wisp. It might turn out that the masses were seized by quite different forces, that they were in pursuit of quite different ends. In that event, there would be no necessary connection between the theory and their activity. It would be a form that enables the masses to become conscious of their socially necessary or fortuitous actions without ensuring a genuine and necessary bond between consciousness and action. Lucas points out that in the same text, Marx briefly lays down the basic condition for achieving real unity of theory and practice. Marx writes, Will theoretical needs be directly practical needs? It is not enough that thought should seek to realize itself. Reality must also strive toward thought. Both Marx and Lucas thus arrive at the conclusion that it is not only the indifference of form toward content that must be overcome, but also the indifference of content toward form. Marx has so far seen the necessity of creating a form of rational interaction in the fulfillment of human needs, and to this end he has identified an agent capable of implementing the demands of reason. But still the form content distinction persists because the needs themselves have not been raised to rational universality only their form under socialism i.e cooperation the proletariat appears as a passive instrument of philosophy because its revolt unconsciously serves the cunning of reason by realizing this form an ungenerous observer could still insist that marx is tossing the roasted pigeons of absolute science into the mouth of the proletariat. Marx now seems to realize that there is no solution within the framework of a formalistic concept of reason, and so he proceeds to a radical critique and revision of the concept of reason itself. Revision of the concept of reason. In the third phase of his early work in the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, Marx sets out to unify theory and practice through revising the concept of reason as it is formulated both in the philosophical tradition and his own previous writings. To accomplish this, Marx returned to the study of need from a new angle. In the early essays, Marx found a form of rational interaction in the pursuit of happiness. But the content of the concept of need with which he worked remained unthema unthematized and unanalyzed. It remained, in fact, immediate, and hence irrational for Marx as it had for earlier political philosophy. This now becomes the decisive problem. If there was a still dogmatic element in the earlier essays, it lay in Marx's failure to derive rational social interaction, the revolutionizing of the elements themselves from the needs it was to help satisfy. <clears throat> Instead, social revolution still appeared as a philosophical ex exigency from which the needy could incidentally benefit. The antinomy of reason and need is not abolished in the accidental convergence of philosophy and the proletariat, but rather reproduced in a new guise. The antinomies of philosophy and reality, theory and practice that appear in Marx's discussion of historical agency are simply displacements of the original antinomy of political philosophy. To resolve these antinomies, Marx reverses the terms of the problem and attempts to found the demands of reason in the very nature of need. But this amounts to demonstrating that the content of the sphere of need is rational, is in fact the essence or the essential sphere of rationality for a metacritically reconstructed concept of reason. How does Marx go about it? I will sketch the three dialectical moments of Marx's metacritique and then elaborate in, in each in some detail. Marx begins by showing that philosophical categories are displacements of social ones. For example, Marx is convinced that the problem of alienated labor is the real foundation of Hegel's philosophy. 
but that Hegel does not pose it correctly. Hegel's standpoint is that of modern political economy. He conceives labor as the essence, the self-configuring essence of man. But labor, as Hegel understands and recognizes it, is abstract mental labor. Thus, that which, above all, constitutes the essence of philosophy, the alienation of man knowing himself, or alienated science thinking itself, Hegel grasps as its essence. The whole artificial, speculative, and ultimately theological structure of Hegel's system results from his failure to thematize real labor as the ontological core of history. Having relativized the philosophical categories with respect to social ones, Marx proceeds to the second moment of the meta-critique, casting the social categories in the form of the philosophical ones. Reductionism is avoided by treating the now socially interpreted categories not, in the, not as empirical facts, but as moments in a philosophical dialectic. Thus, Marx's labor is not that of the economists, but plays a properly philosophical role. Finally, in a third phase, the metacritique demonstrates the power of social action to resolve the contradictions of the philosophically recast social categories. In this phase, Marx is able to show that the alienation of labor is a fundamental problem within philosophy, and not just a contingent social problem. This is impossible for Hegel, who encounters the alienation of labor in history as no more than a passing concern. In sum, Marx defines the terms of Hegel's philosophy while retaining in part the relations Hegel establishes between these terms. Marx can then set the entire system in motion in history because of the social redefinition to which he has submitted it. It is clear that Marx's new definitions do not correspond with Hegel's, and that he shifts back and forth in the manuscripts between his own concepts and Hegel's. But this is not just an ambiguous use of terms. Marx's substantive thesis is that Hegel's concepts are a misconstrual of a reality that Marx himself has described more accurately that he is solving the very problems Hegel addressed in a mystified way. The first phase of Marx's meta-critique is developed in the conclusion of the manuscripts in the critique of Hegel's dialectic. There, Marx argues that Hegel's term alienation stands for the uncomprehended object of thought. To found reason, that is, to demonstrate the unity of subject and object, it is necessary, therefore, to surmount the object of consciousness. Objectivity as such is regarded as an alienated human relationship, which does not correspond with the essence of man. Self-consciousness. The, the return of the alienated, the demonstration of its unity with the conscious subject, consists for Hegel only in surpassing the cognitive appearance of the object. Thus, the appropriation of alienated reality is its comprehension. But Marx argues, in his social application, this method leaves the world exactly as it was before, tacking a certificate of rationality onto every form of oppression. Since alienation is, at least for Hegel, really overcome in philosophy, the need to change the world has vanished. Thought can congratulate itself on having produced the reality and thereby justifying it. This is what Lucas means by philosophy remaining in the standpoint of immediacy. In the Holy Family, Marx and Engels describe it as the mystery, mystery of speculative construction. They write, Speculation, on the one hand, apparently freely creates its object a priori out of itself, and, on the other hand, precisely because it wishes to get rid of sophistry of the rational and natural dependence on the object, falls into the most irrational and unnatural bondage to the object, whose most accidental and most individual attributes it is obliged to construe as absolutely necessary and general. Hegel's error results from describing real alienation as the appearance of the alienation of reason. For Hegel, the alienation of the individual in the ancien regime did not consist in reduction to an abased, enslaved, abandoned, contemptible being.
but in the fact that the state did not correspond with its concept, that in practice, it could not command the rational obedience of its subjects. Once the state has been formed, then it can command rational obedience even from an abased, enslaved, abandoned, contemptible being. There is thus merely contingent there is thus a merely contingent relation between philosophy and Marx's real alienation, which consists in human misery and dependence. The philosopher becomes the enemy of the human community in demonstrating to it that it should accept its fate without protest. He withdraws the moral credit of the oppressed by rationalizing the established order. Marx argues that Hegel falls into uncritical positivism and uncritical idealism because he begins by narrowing the subject to a mere function of thought. For Hegel, human life, man is equivalent to self-consciousness. All alienation of human life is therefore nothing but alienation of self-consciousness. The alienation of self-consciousness is not regarded as the expression reflected in knowledge and thought of the real alienation of human life. Instead, actual alienation, that which appears real, is in its innermost hidden nature, which philosophy first discloses, only the phenomenal being of the alienation of real human life, self-consciousness. Hence, for Hegel, it is not the fact that the human being objectifies himself inhumanely, in opposition to himself, but that he objectifies himself by distinction from and in opposition to abstract thought, which constitutes alienation as it exists and as it has to be transcended. In opposition to the formula he ascribes to Hegel, man equals self-consciousness, Marx argues that man is sensuous, natural existence, and that therefore the subject is a natural being. His essential mode of activity is also natural, labor, not thinking. Similarly, Marx proposes to redefine the concept of the, sub of the object as an essential correlate of the subject, existing proximally for the human senses. Note that Marx does not return to Locke. He does not found knowledge on the senses in the empiricist manner, but redefines subject and object in their, li in their living connection. Thus, Marx's sense object is not a Lockean idea, but the actual object itself, as it exists for the senses and especially as an object of need. Writing still under the influence of Heidegger, in his early review of the manuscripts, Marx rela or Marcuse relates the Marxian concept of sensuousness to Kant's claim that objects are necessarily given through sense perception. Sensuousness is thus a transcendental precondition of access to objectivity in general, and not just a material relationship to particular objects. Feuerbach emphasized the passive nature of the sensuous subject and its quality of neediness and dependence on its objects. These ideas culminate in Marx for whom the distress and neediness that appear in man's sensuousness are no more purely matters of cognition than his distress and neediness as expressed in estranged labor and purely economic. Distress and neediness do not describe the individual modes of man's behavior at all. They are features of his whole being. As such, Marcuse concludes, they are ontological conditions correlated with features of being itself. With the establishment of these new definitions of the philosophical subject and object, the first phase of Marx's metacritique is completed. The second phase of the metacritique then proceeds to reconstitute the formal structure of philosophy of identity with the help of these redefined terms. It is easy to overlook this moment of the metacritique since Marx insists that real natural subjects must have real natural objects. This seems to imply that objects and subjects are things standing in external relations. But the concept of thinghood is inadequate to, to grasp the essence of natural being. Despite the mutual externality of real subjects and objects, his remarks seem to imply Marx goes on to reconstruct their relations in terms modeled on identity philosophy. Michel Henry notes, the structure of the proletariat appears as the structure of consciousness itself, such as this is understood in German metaphysics. 
In this second phase, Marx revises the concepts of need and reason to overcome their antinomic formulation in political philosophy. This revision consists in transferring the formal attributes of reason to need. In Hegel, reason is self-reflective. It mediates itself in the course of its own self-development in history. Again, for Hegel, reason is also universal, both in the narrow sense that its ethical postulates apply equally to all, but also in the broader sense that its unconditioned categories apply to the whole of reality. The unity of subject and object is the foundation of this concept of rationality, the essential demand of reason that establishes reason's imperium. Marx transfers these determinations of rationality wholesale onto man. And since man is Marx's sense in a being of need, need no longer appears as the rational content of a formalistic rationality, but is itself charged with the functions of rationality. For Marx, the philosophical subject is now a natural being, man. As such, this subject encounters its object, nature, in a natural way, through need. The ontological primordial sphere is not that of natural science, in which external relations prevail, but the sphere of need in which subject and object are essentially related. Bertel Ullmann suggests the concept of internal relations to describe this. Marx writes, as a natural embodied sentient ob objective being, man is a suffering conditioned and limited human being like animals and plants. The objects of his drives exist outside himself as objects independent of him, yet they are objects of his needs. Essential objects which are indispensable to the exercise and confirmation of his faculties. Again, the need of an object is the most evident and irrefutable proof that the object belongs to my nature and that the existence of the object for me and its property are the property appropriate to my being. Were this simply a statement about human physiology, it would of course be completely banal. It is no news that hunger requires food. However, Marx is attempting to make a statement about being in general, about ontology, and not just about the empirical being of the human animal. He explicitly affirms that this is an ontological relation and not merely a fact of physiology. He writes, man's feelings, passions, etc., are not merely anthropological characteristics in the narrower sense, but are true ontological affirmations of being, nature. What is more, he proposes a theory of the historical evolution of human need that indicates that it is not only hunger that is objectified in food, but the higher needs of the social human being that find their essential object in the natural world. In this sense, the interdependence of man and nature takes on a larger metaphysical significance that I will call their per participatory identity. Hence, Marx says that nature is the inorganic body of man to express the idea that man and nature, subject and object, are insolubly joined. Now to the labor through which need is satisfied will also appear as an ontological category in the forms of philosophy of identity. Labor is in fact the actual process of unifying subject and object, man and nature. Here Marx passes from the abstract and immediate positing of the unity of subject and object in need to a reflective mediated unity through the production of the object of need by the subject and labor. Such philosophically reconceptualized labor Marx calls objectification, the natural activity of the naturalized subject man. When human beings transform their environment through labor, they objectify their needs and faculties. This they must do, for as a natural being, man must express and authenticate himself in being as well as in thought. The result is a humanized nature within which human beings can fulfill themselves and unfold their, their potentialities in a continuous process of self and world creation. Human existence is confirmed and universalized in the transformed objects of labor and by extension in all of being. Marx writes, it is only when objective reality everywhere becomes for man and society the reality of human faculties, human reality, and the reality of his own faculties, that all objects become for him the objectification of himself.
The objects then confirm and realize his individuality. They are his own objects, which is to say that man himself becomes the object. Marx uses the word human here in an emphatic sense. Man is not merely a natural being, he is a human natural being. Consequently, human objects are not natural objects as they present themselves directly. To be human in this sense is to be social. Thus, the humanization of nature reveals social dimensions of objects hidden to alienated man. The full reality of nature is known to an attuned observer, not to crude perception. The non-musical ear knows less than the musical ear. It misses the truth of what it hears. Marx thus distinguishes between a merely animal relation to the world and the revealing of a meaning. It is in the recognition of meaning that subject and object are united. Thus, society is the accomplished union of man with nature, the veritable resurrection of nature, the realized naturalism of man, and the realized humanism of nature. Finally, the third phase of the Metacritique derives philosophical and political consequences from these formulations consequences that appear once the philosophical terms have been reconstituted in history, where they can be set in motion through social practice. At stake here is the meaning of the concept of alienation, which Marx argues stands in contradiction to the human essence. Hegel's concept of alienation is now revised to mean a specific degraded type of objectification in which the transformed world turns around and dominates its creators instead of serving them. The individuals cannot recognize or develop themselves through alienated objects, but are crushed and oppressed by them. Because alienation as loss of the object is not just a social category, but also a determination of being, it recapitulates the antinomy of subject and object. In alienation, subject and object stand in conflict, as opposed to principles requiring mediation. Identity philosophy demands that the object appear to speculation as a product of the subject, but for Marx this production process is now a real one, occurring in history and not in the head of a philosopher. Alienation is a problem for philosophy, splitting subject from object, but not a problem that should be or that could be solved in pure thought through a speculative construction. Marx notes that the medium through which alienation occurs is, is itself a practical one. Its transcendence will also have to be practical, requiring a reversal in the relations between human beings and the products of their labor. This then is the real alienation that must be overcome, and that Hegel confounds with objectivity itself. Philosophy now appears not as a means through which a subject-object unity is achieved, but rather as the reflection and thought of their unification through labor. <clears throat> If this unity is obstructed by alienation, philosophy too will fail. Thus, where Hegel saw actual alienation, alienation in Marx's sense of the term, as the phenomenal form of the alienation of self-consciousness, Marx reverses the terms and defines the alienation of self-consciousness as the phenomenal form of actual alienation. This alienation of self-consciousness consists in religion and idealistic philosophy. Human beings create a world through labor that dominates and dispossesses them. In thought, too, the products of the mind become dominating powers. The spiritual and intellectual struggle to understand alienation gives rise to myths and speculative constructions. The individuals rationalize their powerlessness and learn, <clears throat> and learn to accept its inevitability as a positive good. The rose and the cross of the present in Hegel, this form of artificial reconciliation with alienation nevertheless points toward the solution by mythologizing the actual unity of subject and object in labor. Such alienated thought, Marx believes, cannot resolve its own antinomies. The concept of reason cannot be found or cannot be founded so long as alienation is immediately accepted in reality. It is the fact that philosophy remains in immediacy that its transcendence of alienation takes place merely in thought and not in real life, that it's responsible for the turn toward a supersensible reality. But if the overcoming of alienation in practice is essential to the liberation of reason from, the, from theological myths, 
then revolution itself is a methodological necessity for philosophy. A characteristic theory-practice relation now emerges, similar to that which Lucas establishes in his early Marxist work. If theory attempts to overcome alienation and pure thought, it will fall into various secularized forms of religion. Yet alienation is the obstacle that must be overcome in order to found reason, for to accept it means to fail to unite subject and object, to demonstrate the production of the latter by the former. <clears throat> Thus theory can found itself only by passing into practice to destroy alienation in reality. Marx writes, It is only in a social context that subjectivism and objectivism, spiritualism and materialism, activity and passivity cease to be antinomies and thus cease to exist as such antinomies. The resolution of the theoretical contradictions is possible only through practical means only through the practical energy of man. The resolution is not by any means, therefore, only a problem of knowledge, but is a real problem of life, which philosophy was unable to solve, precisely because it, because it saw there a purely philosophical problem. <clears throat> the purpose of theory is to provide the proletariat with the intellectual arms it needs to solve not only its own problems, but those of philosophy as well. No longer does theory appear as the real subject of this process, representing rational form to the proletariat, which latter, as mere need or factical content, is a passive material base. Rather, the proletariat's needs are rational in the sense that they reveal the truth of nature. The contradictions the proletariat experiences in its existence are not accidentally related to the contradictions of philosophy, but are one and the same. Theory and practice have been united. In reaching this conclusion, Marx finally derives a wholly new ground for revolution. The ultimate demand of reason is rationality. Revolution alone can satisfy this demand by resolving the antinomies of philosophy. If this is true, then reason itself requires revolution, and every rational individual should lend a hand. From Marx to Lucas this chapter has shown that Marx's early meta-critique of philosophy is in fact a critique of objectivism and formalism, both in politics and more generally in the theory of rationality. These ideas directly influenced later Marxist theory, no notably the Frankfurt School. <clears throat> in chapter four, I will show that Lucas's early Marxist philo philosophy is also deeply influenced by Marx's even though the manuscripts were still unpublished at the time of the composition of history and class consciousness. <clears throat> Insofar as the theory presented in the manuscripts is concerned, this influence is therefore indirect, mediated by Marx's capital. It is precisely because Lucas studied capital to find in it the basis of a meta-critique of formal rationality that he was able to reconstruct and extend its philosophical dimension in a manner of paralleling Marx's own early work. Marx arrived at the study of the economy not merely through a change in interests, but through a philosophical argumentation in the course of which he demonstrated that economics is the science of alienation. It charts the original and basic alienation from which its philosophical forms are derived. Although Marx later abandoned the philosophy of praxis of his early works, the trace of this original discovery of the economy is preserved in his later ones. This trace appears most clearly in the continuing metacritical approach. Capital criticizes formalistic abstractions by bringing them into relation to the social substratum from which they originally derived, or from which they were originally derived. It is true that in capital, these are no longer philosophical abstractions, but economic ones. However, Marx treats these latter in the same way he had treated the former in the manuscripts. The social contradictions he discovers are, in effect, philosophical antinomies, reconstructed in a domain where they can be resolved through social action. The secret of capital, its frequent obscurities, the coquetting with Hegel, the significance Marx attached to it as the basis of a theory of socialist revolution, all this testifies to his fidelity to the original metacritical method. <clears throat>
Thus, capital is more than a scientific work on economics. It is also a chapter in the history of philosophy. However, given its economic focus, capital cannot adequately formulate and resolve the philosophical problems that it implicitly addresses. This leaves a gap between the critique of capitalism and the socialist solution that is often filled by making pseudo-scientific and determinist claims for the economic theory. Whatever Marx himself may have said along those lines on occasion, Marxist economics establishes no causal connection between capitalism and socialism. As I will explain in chapter four, socialist revolution and the transition to a socialist society involve a type of cultural change that cannot be theorized on the model of those processes of natural history to which the mature Marx once compared them. On the contrary, Marx's early metacritique of philosophy comes much closer to anticipating the cultural approach that can alone connect the economic theory of capitalism with socialism. This was Lucas's great insight, the discovery that the critique of formal rationality implicit in Marx's economic works is the key to developing a theory of revolution. Lucas thus based his argument on a work that responded only implicitly, methodologically to his own preoccupations. He made this implicit dimension of Marxism explicit by, re by reconstructing its metacritical premises. Then generalizing Marx's concepts, Lucas reformulated the philosophical implications of the economic theory as the basis of a theory of revolution. To accomplish this, Lucas had to supply the missing moment in the metacritique at the basis of Marxist economics. The moment in which philosophy itself operates with the historicized philosophical concepts to resolve simultaneously both historical and philosophical problems. In taking this step beyond Marx, Lucas developed an original philosophy of praxis. But before turning to it, I need to discuss further the problem of nature in the early Marx. This problem, which first appears in Marx's manuscripts, is central to philosophy of praxis in all its forms.